can, uh, can everyone hear me? Is everything cool, yeah? So I have to apologize, like uh, I made this deck and uh, it was a little too dark. I was afraid that this would happen, but uh, and I have time to uh, get it done again. Anyhow, how's everyone doing? I said, how's everyone doing? All right, let's go. So uh, I'm, a bit of com I'm a bit of a comedian. Uh, I like to have some fun on stage and whatnot. So uh, we're going to have some quick fun. Are we good? All right. So what if LL Cool J was a developer? OK, 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 OK. Yeah, yeah, kind of. All right, all right. What if Biggie Smalls was also a developer? What would he be doing? <laughs> Not so good, kind of? All right. So what if Beyonce loved style sheets? OK. All right. Are we good? Are we good? Can I get going? All right. All right. Let's go. So um, my name's Henri. Uh, I'm from Toronto. I, I am French as well. I'm from Toronto, um, I think the best city in the world. We actually have an amazing festival called Carabana. If you're ever in Toronto this summer, come check it out. It's the best thing on the planet. So I also want to address the elephant in the room. Um, my last name is not Helvetica. <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint everyone. I just thought it'd be a, a cool little handle for the internet. Uh, but you know, as I tell people, don't believe everything you see on the internet. Like, it's just not all there. Now, um, if you do Google my real name, this comes up. And once again, I just tell everyone, do not believe everything you see on the internet, because I'm here standing alive. I don't know. And this actually kind of shocked me, so it was kind of crazy. So anyhow, speaking of the internet, let's talk about the internet. Um, it's a beautiful thing, I personally think. Um, and um, the internet is, I mean, it's been, a while for, it's been around for a little while. And um, for all the, the joy that it brings us, there are also some challenges. And uh, we've had to address these challenges with certain procedures and whatnot. So we're going to talk about that today. So welcome to my presentation, which is, um, well, there it is, Planet of the APIs, um, a tale of performance and user experience. Um, yes, I like to talk about performance. Um, it's kind of a dark art. Um, I compare it to accessibility at times. But it's very important that you look after performance for your web apps or whatever you may do. Um, show of hands, the developers in the room. OK. Um, show of hands, the designers or not developers in the room. OK, it's like a 50-50 split. So I'm going to talk to both you guys today. Um, so let's go. The internet. Um, man, it's been around roughly, comfortably 25 years. And actually, uh, January this year, um, there was a big 25th anniversary, which was Mosaic Browser. Anyone use this? Oh, OK. Like, don't date yourself now. <laughs> and um, this was actually pretty significant. Oh, by the way, does, any, does anyone know where the Mosaic Browser was actually conceived the school? Anyone? Uh, I had a prize for you if you did. It's all good. I'll figure it out. Anyhow, um, this uh, turned 25 uh, in January this year. And the, uh, d the software uh, developer at the time, Mark Arjusen, everyone knows him, um, said this software is going to change everything. And you know what? I think it did. And he went on, actually, in this interview I was reading, and um, Kim Polisi said, for me, things started exploding with the invention of the browser mosaic because suddenly the internet was accessible to the average person. Accessible to the average person. That's not a lie. I mean, I don't say it's entirely true, but it's definitely not a lie. Um, and they actually, uh, when um, mosaic came out, um, they were able to sort of onboard 65 million users uh, in 18 months, which is pretty big at the time anyways. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's almost like, you know, line up to get like some new Yeezys. And uh, <laughs> right? Now, fast forward 25 years, and uh, today, we have over 4 billion people on the internet right now, uh, which is a little crazy. And that's about 
just over 50% of the world population. So think about it. One out of two people anywhere on the planet are actually on the internet right now. Now, if there's one thing that I think all the sort of like silicon savants didn't realize uh, when they're sort of like putting out, uh, whether it be Netscape or, or um, Mosaic and whatnot, is that there were going to be some challenges ahead. And essentially, this was going to be it, the smartphone. Um, the smartphone, actually, as awesome as it is, has created a lot of problems for us, especially on the performance side. Um, again, not only is half the world online, but the majority of the people online are on smartphones. Now, here's a headline that came out a couple years ago. Mobile and tablet internet usage exceeds desktop for the first time worldwide. This was November of 2016. So you have to take that consideration now. There are more people using smartphones than desktop computers right now. Now, in North America, it's probably about a 50-50 split. That's totally cool. But if you want to start to look at numbers outside of North America, it's staggering. You can see Africa right there, 63, about 60. Well, I really bundle mobile and tablet together. So we'll say about 65% mobile. Asia, 65% as well. Now look at India. And they're not even all online yet. And this is why India is often used as sort of like um, a go-to uh, example for like emerging markets because so much is happening there. Now, if you want to add um, basically growth, this is from, 20, from 2000 to present day. Almost 10,000% growth in Africa. Let that sink in. Look at India and Asia, obviously still there. And I mean, I won't bore you with the rest of the stats, but you know, I mean, North America, very flat very flat. So the growth is not here, it's overseas. Now, um, I love this photo because they don't own cars, they don't own TVs, they don't connect to any kind of electricity, but somehow they have a smartphone. So we're t you, you want to talk about like penetration, it's absolutely happening. So um, we do everything on our phone now. I mean, we do banking, pay bills, get an Uber, order food. Uh, again, we might go out and buy new Nikes. Uh, flip through Instagram, slide into your DMs, <laughs> right? That's all through the smartphone right now. But unfortunately, we're also at the mercy of the smartphone, um, all the challenges associated with it. So what are some of these challenges? Well, let's look at them. So we all know we're on networks. We're in New York City right now, 4G. Cool. But would you believe that the majority of the networks across the globe are not 4G? In fact, 4G is the last one, you know, outnumbered by 3 and 2G. And these are not very friendly to actual uh, phone loads. Um, let's look at things like some of the bytes coming down the wire. JavaScript right here. Now, yellow obviously you can see is desktop, blue is mobile. Here's the problem. We're actually sending virtually the, the same amount of bytes down to mobile that we are to desktop. But they are drastically two different devices. And somehow people are expecting everything to work as smoothly as it is on a desktop. Let's look at image bytes, same deal. The exact, nearly the exact same amount of bytes down to the mobile phone. Now, if you actually adjust this for actual requests, it's virtually the same. So really, we have a big problem on our hands. Now, this is a well-known stat. You know, in the, in the performance circles, we talk about this all the time. 53% um, of visitors will abandon a page that takes three seconds or more to load. Now, that was three seconds right there. Most of you are still here, so that's cool. Thank you. <laughs> Even worse, 77% of pages load in 10 seconds or more, with the average page loading in 19 seconds. Now, I mean, I just went through three seconds right there. What does 19 seconds really feel like? You might be like, I don't know, it's not too bad. Like, I know I have some favorite songs that are like three minutes. 19 seconds can be bad. Well, let's look at, <laughs> let's look at 19 seconds. It 
It's still going, it's still going, it's still going, it's still going. So, despite the hilarity, this is the reality. Um, pages aren't loading fast enough, you know. Um, by the way, when I saw that, and you know, the, the, the news outlets were like, a staggering 19 second handshake. And I was like, ding! <laughs> that went right in my deck. Um, but again, you know, pages aren't loading fast enough. And uh, there's an engineer by the name of Pat Meenan, who, whose work I love. Uh, and as he put it, um, he's a Chrome engineer. Um, browsers have been doing what they call um, interventions. Because essentially, there are certain things that are out of our hands, like the network. I mean, networks can be trusted. You know, 4G at one bar, 3G at three bars, 2G at full bars. What does that mean? It just means it's challenging. But there are some things that are in our hands uh, that we're not handling as well as we could. And that's where the browsers come in and sort of like clean up our work. So, with that being said, we're going to look at some of these interventions. Um, but before that, who remembers Firebug? All right, let's go. So Firebug was actually introduced to look at some performance information by Joe Hewitt at the time. He wanted to look at pre and post loads and a few details in between. So essentially, you know, what we're going to look at is along the lines of like a modern Firebug. So let's force, fast forward 25 years, and we're at this present time, talk, we're going to talk about some uh, APIs, specifically um, set around web performance. Because the performance, when we talk about it, it's not always about how fast things are, eight seconds, two seconds, three seconds. It's not always about that. It's mostly about the user experience. How is it perceived? Is someone going to load up your app and be like, OK, I feel good? Or are they going to be sitting there wondering where these 19 seconds just went? So let's start to look at some of these. Um, let's start with the paid timing API. Now, um, again, I talked about you know, once upon a time just dealing with speed metrics, speed numbers. I mean, speed uh, like seconds. Uh, but how fast is the app? How fast is uh, information loading onto the page. The paint, the paint timing API is somewhat set around that. So let's look at these two bits right here. So first paint and first contentful paint. So essentially what's happening with the first paint is, is anything showing up on the screen that's indicating that the page is actually now rendering? And that's very important because a user will look at that and be like, okay, something's happening and I'm going to stick around. So the quicker that happens, the more engaged our user can be, and again, being um, engaged into the, um, the assets loading onto the page. Now, first contentful paint essentially would be an expanded version of the first paint where more items are coming to the page, meaning possibly an image, um, some text, some fonts and whatnot. So again, it's a bit more of a contentful paint to the screen. Now, as an example of that, you'll have to pardon me, generate. I was looking at the generate site last night, which is all good. You know what I mean? I see people like sighing already. It's like, no, 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 no. This is just a, you know, an example. It's a great example. So if you look at the screen right here, um, I'll look at my screen here. Our first contentful paint and our first paint and first contentful paint were virtually the same, and that can happen. And they came in in around four and a half seconds. Now, this was uh, a simulated Moto 4G on 3G, uh, and it was using Chrome as well. Now, um, that's because of the blue box that came in, which is essentially where the menu uh, was going to go. And then you see at five. We, the lines came in, so that probably gave it that 6% rating uh, from the five. And that, basic, that percentage, by the way, is the um, sort of like um, the screen, how much, um, how much product is showing up on the screen. Now, 
And then you can see later on at 64%, we got some more stuff uh, come in. But that's essentially what the paint timing API is going to show us. So the quicker you can get things to show up on the screen, the better that is. Now, um, for the paint timing API, API, sorry, it's supported by Chrome and Opera only. And again, I mean, I talked about some of these experimental um, APIs, so that's what we're going to do. Um, yesterday, I know Wes Boss was kind enough to take my content and just run through it during his talk, and I was like, great, <laughs> you know what I mean? I literally went home wondering if I should just pull this completely, uh, but you know, I'll remix it a little. So, um, I do like the intersection observer a lot, and I'll tell you why. Now, yes, he talked about, or, and I'll talk about that too, um, advertising, it's important for them. Um, so when you guys are scrolling through uh, Instagram again, and you know, the way it's turned into a flea market right now with all the ads, it's a little crazy, um, but there's a good chance the intersection observer is being um, used right there because they can gauge when the ad went through your viewport, how long it was there, when it exited the viewport, things like that. So the, uh, the intersection of observer, pardon me, is definitely good for that. Um, the, uh, we talked about the infinite scrolling. You know what I mean, the pages, you know, you can slowly you know, um, load up some more content as you go down. So again, we were talking about performance, not having wasteful download of data, that's where the intersection observer comes in handy. But if there's one area that I want to talk about where the intersection observer is going to be very important, it's lazy loading. And I'm going to show the example. Now, I think um, Wes may have done this yesterday. I can't really remember. I wasn't paying attention, right? Um, but this is how the observer works. So you can see at the bottom left, Something's coming into the screen, viewport, out, in, out, and you can sort of register that, and you can then, at that point, sort of like, you know, create some logic and, and make it to make sure that uh, the, uh, the items uh, execute as you want. Now, where this comes in handy again, I mentioned, is the lazy loading. Now, um, I'm a big fan of images. I like to talk about images because it's a low-hanging fruit that people seem to not understand well. Unfortunately, a lot of images online are not sized right. They're coming in too big. Unfortunately, a lot of images online are not optimized right, so they're coming in too heavy. So where the intersection observer comes in as, like I said, a intervention, it can handle the lazy loading for you where it's supported, and you can still fall back to a lazy load uh, library. Now, who went to the uh, drink session last night over at uh, Slate New York, whatever, hands up? Yeah? Now, um, who looked for the address on their, on their phone? Because I remember I was lost. I was like, I don't know where I was going. Yeah, yeah? OK. Well, I got good news for you. So I was looking for it last night because I was about to go. and. It was loading a little slowly. I'm like, oh, what's going on? I live in DevTools. I have DevTools open all the time. And lo and behold, oh my God. yes, yes, who said that? There we go. It was a 40 meg site. Um, 27, 27 images totaling 40 megs. Hello. <laughs> So this was like, honestly, I was sitting at my desk, and it was like, oh my god, this example just fell out the sky for me. <laughs> this is so perfect. This is a prime candidate for intersection observer, obviously, and lazy loading as well. But these are the kind of things that are happening online, and you just don't know it. All right, and I don't want to go into this images talk that I have like recorded in my head, but this is actual fact. You can go in right now if you want, since you're on Wi-Fi, you know, so you're not going to burn up your data. Anyhow, um, so that was Intersection Observer, supported by Chrome, Edge, Firefox, Opera, and Safari is actually uh, in progress. They're working on the bug right now, so that should be coming in very soon. Now, one of my favorites, the Network Information API, and again, very much skewed to, um, to performance. And this is where we get 
to take a look at the network. What is happening? What can we do uh, with the conditions that we're in right now? So for example, uh, I might be traveling to see my parents, and I might be taking a train. I might be in between cities, and I end up in these pockets where it's like 2G or 3G, you know, with a sort of large RTT. So if I were to try to, I don't know, watch YouTube off my phone, it might say, hey, you know what? I don't know about that. So let's look at um, what the Network Information API does. So it'll expose uh, these four items. Downlink, effective type, RTT, and save data. Um, the downlink attribute uh, represents essentially the bandwidth that's available in the area you're in right now. And it's calculated from the last few sort of like um, page, view, page views you've had, uh, and it'll just basically uh, calculate to an extent um, the kind of bandwidth that's available to you at this present time. Now, the effective type, which is very important as well, um, it's going to give you four possible readings. Um, slow 2G, 2G, 3G, and 4G. And what they, uh, what they signify is this. If you get a slow 2G rating, it's essentially telling you that the network is likely best used for just plain text. Don't even mess around with images or anything like that because the likely experience will be very poor. Um, 2G, again, suited for small transfer, transfers of small images. Again, nothing too extravagant. When you get into 3G, then it'll, it's basically telling you, it's like, okay, you know what? You can do sort of like large images, potentially retina. You should be all right. And 4G, you're pretty much straight. Um, RTT, again, anyone familiar with that term? Yes, performance people, all gravy. So, um, how could I explain this? Um, it's like basically a ping. It, it observes like what kind of latency is involved in your network at the time. Um, so again, some more data that you can uh, use to your advantage. Now, save data, this is actually a very interesting one. Um, it's part of what we call like a client hint. And essentially, save data is a setting on Chrome and Yandex, another browser, that will broadcast that you are trying to minimize the data usage at that very time. So what ends up happening is that you might be, I don't know, browsing wherever and save data's on, and the server's gonna be like, okay, you know what, he's got save data or she's got save data on. Um, I'm going to reduce um, the, um, I don't know, I'm not gonna send retina images over. Um, I'm going to potentially send less JavaScript down the pipe. Um, I'm potentially going to, again, create a decent experience still, but not potentially send the full gamut over, all right? Because this, like the save data thing, like who's ever used um, Opera browser? Um, do you guys remember the, the turbo mode? Um, essentially where I was saying like, hey, you know, I'm not even trying to mess around with big images. You know, save data is essentially the same thing. Um, and this has been going on for a while. Like people, especially outside of North America, are very sensitive to data. You know, there is a lot of wasteful downloading taking place. And again, we may not feel it because we're in North America, but again, you take that to, you know, God, again, overseas, even countries that you feel might be like quote unquote developed, like some G7 countries, it's the same deal. Um, so that's the save data header. Now, you know, you can go into DevTools and sort of, you know, um, look at it yourself and see exactly what's going on and, and, and see some of the data because, you know, you'll, you'll be potentially you know, say like at the library where they never have like awesome Wi-Fi and you can start to see the kind of changes and the data that comes up when uh, you use the network information API. Now again, once you use this kind of information, you can start to create these conditional loads depending on what the user is on at the very time. 
Because again, we are trying to have a proper user experience and no need to send all the, um, the items down the wire if they're not gonna be able to um, use them properly. Now, I know there's no slide here, but I wish it was nicer. Now, having looked at all of that, what can we do with it? Well, I'll give you a quick example. Um, I'm a bit of a basketball fan, just a little bit. And during March Madness, I just read this article, um, and I was playing around with this thing called BigQuery. And uh, I was essentially you know, looking at some performance data. And I thought it might be interesting to go out and look at sports blogs and how fast they load and look at some of the performance information that I could pull off there. So specifically, I looked at five and I, was, I used uh, some paint timing information as well as some network um, information to get some of the results. So, ah, it's not the clearest, but it should be all right. So, first contentful paint, sports blogs. That's what it's called. And um, I basically was able to pull some information, create this histogram, and you'll see exactly what was going on. Now, this was ble Bleacher Report. And how this histogram reads is as follows. Um, the first contentful paint in 200 millisecond uh, bins. So basically, the more you have as far left as possible, the better it is. Got it? So this was, um, like I said, Bleacher Report. And you could tell right here, around like one second, 1,200 milliseconds, they're getting the majority of their um, first, content, uh, first contentful paint uh, in the users. Now, CBS Sports was a little better because you could see like a bit of it shifted to the left. ESPN got it going on. <laughs> like they're, they're doing something good over there, you know, and that was actually pretty interesting because I was like, okay, ESPN, let's go. And now this was actually all done on 4G, three and 4G combined um, on mobile as well, I forgot to mention. And mobile was basically uh, excluding tablet in this case. Um, SI.com, not gangster. You know, I, I, as the kids would say, that's not wavy, <laughs> right? Uh, and the last one was Yahoo Sports. It was like, meh, middle of the road. Now, with all that, what do you do? Well, you go back to the office and you have something like this, which is a meeting. <laughs> and in this meeting, you have these three people. You have engineering, you have the content person, and you have the sales and marketing. They all have their own little needs and wants, but this is how you look at the data all together and figure out how best to use it. Because sales and marketing might be like, yo, I need some of these ads in here. And you're like, I don't know about that. Because engineering has a laptop and pulls out the data. Talk about, look at the first paint, look at the first contentful paint. And this is all on 3G. Then content's like, okay, well, you know what? You know, we have some videos that we have to put up there. Engineering's like, well, I don't know about that. And she's got the information again. Now, again, the key is to sort of gather the data and parse through it and understand what's going on and what's best for the users in the end. Because if you end up with a site where none of your paints are happening early enough, there's something you have to go back and take a look at. And I didn't put the slide in because I didn't, I didn't know if I was gonna have time, but what I then did, I went a little deeper and looked at the page on a whole, like what kind of resources they were loading. Um, you know, some things like time to interactive, like how quickly could you like 
tap on the screen and have something happening. So once you have like some like the early information, you can go back and dig deeper and understand what's going on. Now, with that being said, and I do have some time to spare, which I'm a little shocked about, um, I want to mention um, a few other items that you, know, you could possibly take a look at on your own. Things like server timing API. So who works with CMSs here, like WordPress and whatnot? This is gonna be your best friend because this is going to help you pull what's going on in the background, like your SQL, your database reads, little things like that. Long task API, um, that's gonna to have to do obviously as well, well, I don't say obviously because it's still kind of new, but it's going to have to do with some of your uh, JavaScript interactivity because that's very important, but we're noticing also that some of these you know, times to interactive, like how quickly can I uh, interact with the app, some of these times are fairly long, and that's not good. Now, I put that in there, and I should have really graded out the battery status API. It's kind of like a bad word. Um, browser vendors, a few have been adamant on pulling support for it, like Safari doesn't support, doesn't support it, Firefox doesn't support it. Um, Chrome still does. And there's a bit of a debate as to whether or not that should be happening. Because one of the concerns, there are security concerns, but one of the concerns, and I'll give you sort of like a very simple example, you are down to like 10% on your phone, and you're like desperate to call the Uber, and you're just like, oh my God, do I have enough battery left to call Uber? Uber's like, oh, they have no battery left. We're going to, uh, double the rate. Ah, uh, but Uber wouldn't do that, would they? <laughs> of course they wouldn't, right? But, you know, that's like a very simple one, but those are the kind of concerns um, around the battery status API. Anyhow, um, with seven minutes and 50 seconds left, I should get a gold medal, because I didn't think I'd make it. Uh, I want to thank everyone. That's it. <laughs> <laughs>